Okay. Um, Chris, what happens to resting heart rate as intensity goes up and why? It stays the same. Good, why? Because those who are like untrained, they're not really affected by, because it's just their resting heart rate. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't matter if the person is trained or untrained. Their, their resting heart rate is not gonna be affected by exercise intensity. Um, Rosie Martinez, what happens to max heart rate as intensity increases? It um, stays the same. Okay, why? Because it's a, uh, it already reached their max. Like it's already at the max, um, heart rate can't really like go more above it. Well, they're not necessarily at their max heart rate. If they're increasing their intensity, four miles per hour, five miles per hour, six miles per hour, are they at their max heart rate? No. I'm not too sure. Esmeralda, go ahead. You gotta unmute yourself. Can you repeat the question? What happens to max heart rate as exercise intensity increases and why? Well, your max heart rate is uh, 220 minus your age. So you can't really change that unless you like, grow older, then your max heart rate increases. It's, just, it's not affected by exercise intensity. Some things are affected and some things are not. Um, Caroline, what happens to submax heart rate as intensity increases and why? Your sub, sub max heart rate increases due to uh, decreased vagal tone, increased epinephrine, and increased sympathetic cardiac nerve. Okay, so a decrease in the parasympathetic activity, an increase That's in sympathetic increasing. activity, yeah. and you have details there. Awesome. Um, Susanna, what happens to AVO2 difference sub max as intensity increases? Um, it stays the same. Why? Um, because I know it's like because it's the max, but I'm not sure like what exactly like max. So that would be true for max, but I asked for sub max. AVO two different sub max. Oh, the sub max. Oh, because um, the exercising muscle needs um oxygen. So, it, oh, so the submax increases as I should. increase. Good. AVO2 different submax will increase as intensity increases because the muscle is consuming more oxygen. So you have a bigger difference between the oxygen content. Okay. Um, Eddie, what happens to submax stroke volume as intensity increases? And why? Submax. Submax. Uh, stroke volume increases. Um, well, it was that whole map that you showed us. I'm trying to remember the shorthand that you gave. It was like the end diastolic volume increases and the end systolic volume decreases. Mm -hmm. um, so the ETV goes up because of increased venous return. And um, I'm trying not to look at my notes. I don't remember the sensibility left ventricular distensibility, and then um, ESV decreases because of increased contractility and uh, decrease in resistance. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So that's a short version. You should be prepared if I ask for details to give all the details for that. Caroline, you have a question? Yeah, so I was like practicing the map and I feel like comfortable like I can do the map, but it, there's some things like I'm like, why does that lead to that? So for increased venous return, does that lead to increased end diastolic volume because then the ventricle is full? Mm -hmm. And then increased dis distensibilities because it stretches more when it's full? Exactly. Oh, okay. And then yes. for the muscle contraction, why does it lead to the local conditions? Why does muscle contraction lead to the local conditions? Is that, I think I know why, but I don't want to like. <laughs> okay, so contracting the muscles is going to consume oxygen. So oxygen will be low. It's going to produce carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide will be high. Yeah. Muscle contraction will produce lactic acid. So lactic acid will be high. Hydrogen will be high. pH will be low. 
Oh, okay. The contracting yeah. muscle will produce heat, so temperature will be high. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. <laughs> so muscle contraction explains all those local conditions. You should be able to explain what's causing those conditions. That's going to be sensed by the chemoreceptors trigger vaso. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Um, Tito, what happens to submax cardiac output as intensity increases and why? Um, submax cardiac output. Uh, that will that will increase. Why? Because of uh, heart rate increases and stroke volume increases. Good. So if I asked for detail, you'd have to explain the heart, the reasons heart rate is increasing and the reasons the stroke volume is increasing to explain why cardiac output is increasing. Okay. That's where we ended, I believe. Yes. Any questions on any of that? Okay. So we're going to flip over and go to the other side of the table, which is VO2 max. So what do you think happens to VO2 max as your exercise intensity increases? Take a guess. London, what do you think? Stays the same. Stays the same. It's a max. So remember, you have a resting VO2. London, do you remember what resting VO2 is? There's a number for that. James, do you remember? I, is it 3.5 mils mm -hmm. over? 3.5 mLs per kg per minute is resting oxygen consumption. We have a max VO2, and everything in between is submax when you're exercising. Okay, so your max VO2, if your max VO2 is 50 mLs per kg per minute, if you increase your exercise intensity, 5 mLs per hour, 6 mLs per hour, 7 mLs per hour, doesn't affect where your max is. Okay, regular chronic training will affect where your max is, but just increasing your exercise intensity during one bout of exercise, not affected. Okay. But we're going to look at that in a little more detail, so I'm going to give you a formula for VO2. VO2 equals cardiac output times AVO2 difference. Professor, will we put this under the um, VO2 max? or? Um, it's, I'm going to get there, okay. yeah, but I'm going to give you this formula first and then we're going to talk about max and some max. So we can break down cardiac output into heart rate and stroke volume, right? So I can say VO2. So right now this is not max or submax, it's just VO2. Oops. VO2 equals heart rate times stroke volume. times AV O2 difference. Okay, what I'd like you to do is take all of your colored pens and put boxes around this formula in as many colors as you have. Put stars on it. Draw attention to it in as many ways as you can think of here to this formula. This formula is very, very, very important. Okay, we refer to this as the Fick equation. Not to be confused with Fick's law. Completely different. Okay, the Fick equation, VO2 equals heart rate times stroke volume times AVO2 difference. I cannot express to you how important this formula is to exercise physiology. For the rest of this semester, very, very important. And going into 446, very, very important that you understand what controls oxygen consumption. Okay, if you take Andrews for 446, he will ask you for the Fick equation on the first day. And every semester, pretty much, the 446 instructors come to me and they say, students don't know the Fick equation. And I say, well, I know I taught it to them. And I know I emphasized it, and no matter how much I emphasize it, students still tend to forget. And I know that you have the summer in between when you're going to take 346 yeah. and 446, but you've got to remember the Fick equation. 
okay? What I suggest is that you print it out as large as you can across a piece of paper, print it out, laminate it, stick it on your fridge so you see it every time you go to the fridge. Print out another one, as large as you can, laminate it, put it under your pillow, hope for some kind of osmosis thing there. And then if you're really determined, take a Sharpie, write it backwards across your forehead so you'll see it every time you look in the mirror. That's how important this equation is. Do not forget the Fick equation, okay? When I ask you for a Fick equation, it should roll off your tongue. You know exactly what it is, okay? So if we're talking about VO2 max, then we're talking about heart rate max times stroke volume max times AV O2 difference max, which also means we're talking about cardiac output max. Okay, so to talk about why VO2 max is increasing, we have to talk about what's happening to each of these components. What happens to heart rate? Sorry, VO2 max is not increasing. VO2 max we said is staying the same. What's happening to heart rate max as intensity increases? Stays the same. Stays the same. Heart rate max is not affected by exercise intensity. What happens to stroke volume max? Same. Stays the same. What happens to cardiac output max? Same. Not affected. What happens to AVO2 difference max? Stays the same. So VO2 max is not affected by exercise intensity because all of the components of VO2 max are not affected by exercise intensity. Make sense? Okay, so that means if we're talking about submax equals heart rate submax, times stroke volume submax times AV O2 difference submax, which is also cardiac output submax. Okay, so before we even go into any of those, what do you know happens to VO2 submax as intensity increases? We've already talked about this. It increases. It increases. And we even have a graph for that, right? As intensity increases, oxygen consumption increases. We know that. As intensity increases, heart rate increases, oxygen consumption increases. We already talked about all those things, okay? So now we need to go into a detailed explanation of what's causing the increases in oxygen consumption during exercise. What's happening to heart rate as intensity increases? Esmeralda, what's happening to heart rate submax as intensity increases? Increasing. Increasing, and you should be able to explain in detail why. Okay, Ismael, what's happening to stroke volume, stroke volume submax as intensity increases? Yeah, it increases as well. It increases, and you should be able to give me a detailed explanation why. Therefore, cardiac output is increasing. Okay. Um, James, what happens to AVO2 difference submax as intensity increases? Increases also. Increases, and you should be able to explain why. Okay, so explaining what causes the increases in oxygen consumption during exercise, you should have a lot of details to explain this. Okay, you can no longer say oxygen consumption is increasing as intensity increases because the muscles need more oxygen. No, that's not a physiological answer. On the physiological mechanism behind the increase in oxygen consumption during exercise. Okay, heart rate is increasing, explain why. Stroke volume is increasing, explain why. Therefore, you have an increase in cardiac output. AVO2 difference is increasing, explain why. That's a huge question. Okay, any questions on that concept or that formula? The explanation 
why is just it's the same thing as um what we learned um for the last exam right mm -hmm. well not for the last exam we just learned this when we in the last lecture when we started the table well heart, the heart rate stuff you learned for the last exam the decrease in pns the increase in sns the stroke volume we just learned in the last lecture the end diastolic volume minus the end systolic volume and the whole map that goes with that that all goes there the okay. AV2, the, the AVO2 is, should be the same also, right? AVO2 difference is increasing, submax. Right. Because the, the expl muscles explanation muscles. should be the same as I did before. Yeah. So we're just okay. inserting those in here. So okay. before we talked about oxygen consumption, we had to talk about heart rate, stroke volume, cardiac output, and AVO2 difference. Okay. Once okay. we have all those pieces, we can put them together to explain oxygen consumption. Okay, cool. Thank you. Good. Okay. Okay. Next thing on your table is lactate threshold. Um, Jasmine, can you please give me a definition of lactate threshold? It's the point at which lactic acid um, begins to accumulate. So you're producing more, producing it faster than you can clear it. Right. So we have a graph for that. X axis is intensity. And y-axis is blood lactate. So we had an issue with this on the exam. People saying that lactate threshold is the accumulation of lactic acid, which is a problem because this entire thing is accumulation of lactic acid. This entire thing is not lactate threshold. Okay, lactate threshold is the point at which lactic acid begins to accumulate. That's different than saying the accumulation of lactic acid. Okay, you have to be specific. So what happens to lactate threshold as exercise intensity increases? What do you think? Yeah, Somebody take that yes. What happens to lactate threshold as exercise intensity increases? Does it increase, decrease, or stay the same? Stay the same. Okay. Okay, I heard increase and I heard stay the same. Someone want to explain? For exercise, it just stays the same. If you're training, it'll increase. Okay, so who said that it increases? Do you want to explain why you think lactate threshold increases? I changed my mind. Okay, so are we agreeing that it stays the same? Yes. Okay, so lactate threshold is a threshold. It's like a max. So remember we said we can think about it as everything you're doing below lactate threshold is primarily aerobic. Everything you're doing above lactate threshold is when you're getting a significant anaerobic contribution. So lactate threshold is, is like the highest intensity that you can maintain before you start accumulating lactic acid, okay? It's like a max. So if you're increasing your exercise intensity, that's going in this direction, so you might pass your lactate threshold, okay? If you hit your lactate threshold at um, six miles per hour and you're increasing five miles per hour, six miles per hour, seven miles per hour, eight miles per hour, you're passing your lactate threshold, but you're not moving your lactate threshold. What's increasing here on this graph as intensity increases? What's going up? Blood lactate. Lactate level. So as you increase your intensity, you're producing more lactic acid. And you're producing it faster, you can clear it, so it's accumulating. But that didn't move your lactate threshold. You just passed your lactate threshold. You didn't move it. If you want to move your lactate threshold, you have to do chronic training, right? And we talked about how high intensity training would move it and how endurance training would move it. But just increasing your speed on the treadmill does not change your threshold. Everybody okay with that? Okay, next thing on your table is blood pH. What happens to blood pH as intensity increases? These are common sense things you can figure out. Decrease. I'm sorry, Esmeralda, what did you say? Decrease. Decrease, so why would pH decrease as intensity increases? Because um, as hemoglobin is approaching the exercising muscle, blood is gonna, the blood pH is gonna decrease, so that allows, um, the hemoglobin to release the oxygen, then the myoglobin is going to receive 
the um, the oxygen delivering it to the mitochondria? Okay, so everything you said is true, but it doesn't answer the question. So does hemoglobin bringing its oxygen to the exercising muscle cause a decrease in pH? The decreased pH causes hemoglobin to release the oxygen. Hemoglobin releasing the oxygen does not cause the decrease in pH. Svetlana, what's causing the decrease in pH? The local conditions at the exercising muscle. Can you be more specific? Um, how is it not the lactic acid? It is, the hydrogen specifically from the lactic acid. Remember, pH reflects acidity. The more acidic the blood is, the lower the pH. So as you increase your exercise intensity, we're producing more lactic acid, right? The hydrogen from that lactic acid makes the blood more acidic. So the higher our intensity, the more acidic the blood, lower the pH goes. Does that make sense? Okay, so it's not all the other conditions of the exercising muscle affecting the pH. The only ones that affect the pH are the hydrogen and the carbon dioxide. That's what makes that acidic. Questions? Okay, next one on your table is plasma volume. What do you think happens to plasma volume as intensity increases? Decrease. Okay, good, Caroline, why? Um, isn't it because like you're, you're sweating, it increases, isn't it sort of like mm -hmm. have to do with the cardiac drift a little bit, like it increases your sweating? Mm -hmm. Exactly, so the higher your intensity, the more you sweat. Vasodilation of the skin, the more you sweat for thermoregulation. That sweat is coming from your plasma. So your plasma level is going to drop because you're sweating, and also because when you're exercising, some of that plasma goes into the muscles, out of the blood and into the muscles. So plasma volume drops for two reasons as intensity increases. One, because you're sweating, and two, because some of the plasma is going into the muscle. Okay, next one is red blood cell count. What do you think happens to red blood cell count as exercise intensity increases? Take a guess. It stays the same. Yeah, if you increase your speed on the treadmill, five miles per hour, six miles per hour, seven miles per hour, is that gonna trigger your body to produce more red blood cells immediately? Is it gonna kill off some of your red blood cells immediately? It's not. Increasing your intensity in the moment is not going to affect your red blood cell count. Training will, but increasing exercise intensity will not. Okay, next one's hematocrit. What happens to hematocrit as intensity increases? Is it gonna increase? Okay, why would it increase? Because the plasma volume is decreasing. Exactly. So remember, hematocrit is formed elements divided by total blood volume. It's what percentage of your blood is formed elements. So if your plasma volume decreases from sweat and fluid going into the muscle, red blood cell count stays the same it means a higher percentage of your total blood volume is formed elements. It means your blood is thicker. So this is an increase in hematocrit because you have a decrease in plasma, a decrease in total blood volume, but red blood cell stays the same. So your blood is gonna get thicker as you increase your intensity. Questions on that one? Okay, next one is blood pressure. Submax blood pressure, and we're specifically talking about systolic blood pressure. Okay, what happens to systolic blood pressure at submax as exercise intensity goes up? It increases. It increases. So if you're taking someone's blood pressure, I don't know if you guys got a chance to do this in the lab, it's normal for blood pressure to increase as intensity goes up. So you think about it, 
that left ventricular myocardium is going to be contracting more forcefully, right, due to the epinephrine. So as that ventricle contracts more forcefully, the blood is coming out more forcefully and hitting the wall of the aorta. And that's what blood pressure is, right? The, the pressure that the blood is exerting against the force of the vessel. So as we contract more forcefully, the blood hits the, the wall of the aorta more forcefully. It's an increase in blood pressure. So it's normal for systolic blood pressure to increase with increasing exercise intensity. Diastolic blood pressure should not. Diastolic is during diastole when the ventricle is relaxing. So there shouldn't be an increase in how hard the, the blood is hitting the wall of the vessel when the ventricle is relaxed. So diastolic blood pressure is gonna stay the same, but systolic blood pressure is gonna increase, okay? So let's go into detail about what's causing the increases in blood pressure. In order to do that, we need the formula. What's the short formula for blood pressure? Professor Fleck? Yep. Real quick, can you go through the boxes? Like VO2 would stay the same, VO2 submax was increased. VO2 max stays the same. We wrote out the formula. We said all of those components of VO2 max stay the same. Therefore, VO2 max stays the same. VO2 submax is increasing because heart rate submax, stroke volume submax, cardiac output submax, and a VO2 difference sub submax are all increasing. Okay, short formula for blood pressure. Cardiac output times peripheral resistance. Okay, and the expanded formula then would be? Stroke volume times heart rate times length of the vessel times viscosity of the blood divided by vessel of the radius to the fourth power okay so we already said submax systolic blood pressure is going to increase Let's look at the components of it, see what's happening. What's happening to, so these are all submax, heart rate submax, stroke volume submax, cardiac output submax. What's happening to heart rate submax as intensity increases? It increases. Thank you, Cindy. It increases, and you should be able to explain why. What's happening to stroke volume submax? Increasing. And you should be able to explain why. Therefore, cardiac output is increasing. Okay. Is anything happening to the length of the vessel as we increase our intensity? No. No. Is anything happening to viscosity? Yes. What's happening? It's increasing. I'm sorry, what did you say? It's increasing. Why is it increasing? Because you're sweating, so your plasma is decreasing, so the hematocrit's increasing. So increased hematocrit, and you should be able to explain why. Is anything happening to radius? <laughs> As you increase exercise intensity, what happens to the vessel radius? Does it decrease? Okay, what would cause it to decrease? Vasoconstriction. Vasoconstriction due to epinephrine acting on the arterioles, right? Is anything else happening to the radius? It's also increasing. Why? Because of the local conditions causing uh, vasodilation? Dilation due to the arterial autoregulation. Okay, so we talked about last time how it's possible that we have both vasoconstriction and vasodilation happening at the same time in different areas of the body. Okay, so in some places we have a decreased radius, in some places we have an increased radius. There's a lot going on here with peripheral resistance. So overall, with all of these things happening, we get an overall decrease in peripheral resistance as our intensity goes up because of the vasodilation. 
So we're getting an overall decrease in peripheral resistance. So it looks like mathematically, if we have an increase in cardiac output and a decrease in peripheral resistance, that should cause blood pressure to stay the same mathematically. So how is it possible that we're able to increase our blood pressure here even though peripheral resistance is decreasing? Is it because the number for cardiac output should be higher than the number for peripheral resistance? Exactly. The increases in cardiac output are large. So we're able to get an increase in blood pressure even though resistance overall is decreasing. Okay, so if I were to ask you what's causing the increases in blood pressure as intensity increases, if you said increased cardiac output and increased peripheral resistance, that would be incorrect. If you said increased cardiac output and decreased peripheral resistance, that would also technically be incorrect because the decreased peripheral resistance is not causing the increase in blood pressure. So what's causing the increase in blood pressure as intensity increases? Large increase in cardiac output. Exactly. Large increases in cardiac output are causing the increases in blood pressure. Good. Questions on that one? Okay. Can I'm going to add. Go ahead. Sorry. Can you go over again uh, the vasoconstriction? Like, well, I'm so, so confused. When you, when you increase your exercise intensity, you release epinephrine. Epinephrine acts on the arterioles to cause vasoconstriction. Decrease in radius, increase in resistance. But we have a lot of vasodilation. The more you're exercising, higher your intensity, the more vasodilation you'll have. So we'll end up having an overall decrease. Okay, um, add on to your table underneath the Submax blood pressure, add on RER. Talk about what happens to RER. Um, let me hear my son playing clarinet. Um, Sydney, what does RER stand for? What is the range and what does it mean? Uh, respiratory exchange ratio. The ranges are 0. 0.7 to 1. And what else do you ask? Sorry. Uh, what does that mean? Oh, um, it's uh, substrate utilization versus, well, that, but it's um, carbon dioxide produced over oxygen consumed. Okay, so 0.7 would mean what? Your primarily fat utilization. Okay, 100% fat utilization. And one would mean? Carbohydrate utilization. Can RER go above one? Yes. How? Uh, the carbon dioxide from the bicarbonate buffer. Exactly. We had an issue with that one on the, on the test. So RER goes above one not because of reliance on carbohydrates. Reliance on carbohydrates would bring it up to one. Only reason it can go over one is because of excess carbon dioxide from the bicarbonate buffer at the high intensities. Okay, so now the question is what happens to RER as exercise intensity increases? Increase, decrease, or stay the same? Cindy says increase. Okay, Cindy, why is it increasing? Um, for just exercise intensity because you're, you're using more carbs. Because right. you're not used to that, so your body uses more carbon. But if it's training, then it would probably depend on how well trained you are. We'll talk about training in the next chapter. But as exercise intensity increases, you rely more on carbohydrates, therefore RER goes up, and even use the bicarbonate buffer, which would make it go up even higher. Good. So, um, Brianna, can you explain why we use more carbohydrates at higher intensities? Oh, there's two Briannas. Um, I was actually looking at Brianna Hernandez, but Brianna Chavez, you can answer if you want. I'll pass. Okay, Brianna Hernandez. Can you repeat the question one more time? Uh, yes, why do we rely more on carbohydrates at higher intensities? 
Is it because I'll pass too? Sorry. Okay, that's okay. Um, Harrison, why do we rely more on carbohydrates as intensity increases? Because we're working more anaerobically. Mm -hmm. And anaerobically, you can't use fat, right? And part of the reason we're working more anaerobically is because we're relying more on our fast twitch fibers. Fast twitch fibers are better at anaerobic metabolism. Remember, we talked about all that when we talked about the crossover concept. So that's all connected here. I'm about to sneeze. Okay. Okay, any questions on RER? Okay, so we're finished with that part of the table. I have two more concepts I'm going to cover real quick for this chapter. And then we'll be done with this chapter and we'll start the next chapter in the next lecture. Okay, so first one is ventilatory threshold. So this is not on your table. Ventilatory threshold is the point at which your ventilation rate begins to increase rapidly as intensity increases. Ventilatory threshold, the point at which your ventilation rate begins to increase rapidly as intensity increases. Ventilatory threshold, the point at which your ventilation rate begins to increase rapidly as intensity increases. This is ventilation low, medium, high, low, medium, high. So ventilation rate is how fast you're breathing. Okay, so as your intensity increases, at the low intensity, not a lot is happening with your breathing rate. But at some point, you're gonna hit an intensity where there's gonna be a rapid increase. I didn't mean to go quite that high, <laughs> that's okay. Um, you're gonna hit some point of your intensity where there's going to suddenly be a rapid increase in your breathing rate. This is the ventilatory threshold. Does this remind you of something? The lactate threshold. Lactate threshold. Do you think they're related? Yes. Yeah, sure. Okay, hey, London, can you connect the two? Not quite. Not yet. Okay. Anyone want to try connecting the two? Um, would it be because in lactate threshold there was um the threshold where it uh, it was like, I guess, a max, and it's sort of the same here for the ventilatory. Okay, but how they're related, you need to figure out how they're related. They happen at the same time. Jasmine? Hydrogen. Is it because you're accumulating a lot of um, carbon dioxide? So by breathing faster, you're um, expiring all the carbon dioxide, bringing in more oxygen? Yes, remember the carbon dioxide as a function, it triggers the inspiratory centers in your brain to cause you to increase your ventilation rate so you can blow off the carbon dioxide. What, where's the carbon dioxide coming from at high intensity? The bicarbonate buffer? Bicarbonate buffer. So we reach ventilatory threshold at about the same time we reach lactate threshold. When you hit your lactate threshold, you're starting to rely heavily on your anaerobic system, which means you're producing a lot of lactic acid, which means your bicarbonate buffer is working. Bicarbonate buffer is going to produce carbon dioxide, which is going to trigger the inspiratory centers in your brain to increase your ventilation rate. So remember, that's why I said the burning in your muscles at high intensity always goes along with you being out of breath. Those two things will always happen together because the lactic acid is gonna be working with the bicarbonate buffer to create carbon dioxide, which is gonna cause you to breathe faster. Thank you. My son just gave me a roll. 
Does that make sense? So the link between the two is bicarbonate buffer. So a ventilatory threshold mirrors the lactate threshold, meaning they happen at the same time. And the bicarbonate buffer is the link. Everybody okay with that? You said the ventilatory threshold mirrors what? The lactate threshold. Lactate threshold, okay. Yeah, so remember I said that's how you can tell if you're in glycolysis. Your muscles are burning and you're out of breath. Those two things happen together. You'll never have muscles burning without breathlessness. They go together. Do you mind repeating the definition for ventilatory threshold? Uh, ventilatory threshold is, you can basically do the lactate threshold definition, but insert ventilation rate instead of lactate. So it's the point at which ventilation rate incre begins to increase rapidly as intensity increases. Okay, so last topic here is active recovery, which I've actually already talked about, but I want to um, remind you of what it is. So active recovery just means during your recovery, you're not going to sit down. You're going to remain active moving around. So we don't let people sit down right as they're finishing their workout. We encourage them to continue moving around. Do you remember why that is? Do you remember? I gave you two reasons. Do you remember one of them? Um, one of them is venous return. So um, blood begins to pull out your lower extremities um, if you don't keep moving. So one of them is um, the skeletal muscle pump. So if you keep moving, that's going to allow um, blood to go back up to the heart. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So when you're exercising, remember your heart is pumping. If you stop exercising and you stand still or you sit down, you don't have the skeletal muscle pump actively pumping blood back up to the heart, but the heart is still pumping. So we need to keep activating the skeletal muscle pump to increase our venous return. Otherwise, we'll pass out. That was one of the reasons. Does anybody remember the other reason? wouldn't expect you to, but I know I did mention it. I'll put up a hint. Is it to prevent lactic acid buildup? And try to mute those microphones. Um, you guys make sure your microphones are muted, please. We're getting background noise. Okay, so what um, enzyme goes here? Dehydrogenase. Lactate dehydrogenase. Okay, is this bringing back any memories of what we talked about here? Yeah, for glycolysis. Well, for active recovery, what does this have to do with active recovery? Remember? Some of the lactic acid is going to return. Oh, so, in to prevent buildup, in the um, remember that lactic dehydrogenase works in both directions pyruvate to lactic acid and lactic acid to pyruvate. So, in fast twitch fibers that work anaerobically. Lactic dehydrogenase prefers to work in this direction, creating lactic acid. In the slow twitch fibers, lactic dehydrogenase prefers to work in this direction, clearing lactic acid. When we bring lactic acid into pyruvate, then it becomes what? What's over here? Acetylcholine. Remember that, which feeds into the Krebs cycle. So we can bring it into the muscle and create ATP from it. So remember one of the fates of lactic acid was to go to other muscles, okay? So if you're producing it in a fast twitch fiber, you bring it to a slow twitch fiber, muscle contraction in the slow twitch fibers triggers the lactic dehydrogenase to bring the lactic acid in. So you need to keep contracting your slow twitch muscles, working at a low intensity to help you clear lactic acid as part of recovery, active recovery. So what happens is if you, we talked about if you're working in your ATP PCR system and you deplete your PCR, how long it takes to recover that? 
we said three to five minutes, right, to replenish that PCR. In glycolysis, if you drop your pH levels down, remember dropping your pH is a big part of what causes fatigue in glycolysis. If you drop your pH down to intolerable levels, meaning it causes failure, which isn't that hard to do, okay? Our normal pH, I don't remember the exact number, our normal pH is seven something, intolerable pH is six something. So it's not that hard to get down to intolerable levels. If you get down to intolerable pH levels, it takes 30 to 35 minutes to get back to normal pH levels, a long time. So anything you can do to speed that up is gonna help you, especially if you have another performance that you're gonna do, okay? So for example, when my son runs track, he runs the distance events in track. So he'll have a mile race and a two mile race on the same day. So if he runs the mile, for, the mile's always first, so a mile, if you're racing a mile, it's highly anaerobic. So he's gonna have a lot of hydrogen accumulation at the end of that race. If he has a two mile race an hour later, it's very, very important that he does a cool down to clear that lactic acid, okay? It's easy to say, well, he has an hour in between races, he needs to sit down and rest, which is true, he should do some resting, but he's gotta do a cool down to clear the lactic acid to have his optimal performance in the second race. Okay, if you're not doing anything else later, it doesn't really matter, you can take as long as you want to clear your lactic acid, but if you have another performance coming up, active recovery is gonna help you recover faster for your next performance, helping you clear lactic acid. So just to recap, the cool down is going to help clear the lactic acid faster by turning it into pyruvate? Yes, bringing it into slow twitch fiber. So we're not really referring to this as recovery. We're referring to it, uh, or we're not referring to it as a cool down. We're referring to it as active recovery. So even if it's in between, if you're just taking a one minute rest in between intervals, if you're active at a low intensity during that recovery period in between, you're gonna recover faster than if you were to sit during that recovery. You'll clear act, let more lactic acid if you're active than if you're sitting. Okay, so we are done with chapter eight. So um, finish your study guide for chapter eight, get ready for your quiz. Um, and then when we come in on Wednesday, we will start the next chapter, which is chapter 11, which is gonna be training adaptations. We'll start with endurance training, we'll fill out the rest of the table, and then we'll get into anaerobic training. Okay? Oh, let me put up my sign up sheet for office hours. So if you wanna come, my next office hours are Wednesday before your class. So, um, let me put this up real quick, share screen. Quick question, this chapter was eight, correct? This was chapter eight, yes. You're saying we have to sign up for office hours now? I'm gonna put up a sign up sheet for 10 minutes blocks in office hours to go over your test. Oh, I see. So if you came in late, you didn't, might not have heard me talking about that. So I don't know why I'm not able to see it in my screen share. Not coming up. There it is. Okay, so 10 minute blocks during my Wednesday office hours and Thursday office hours. If you go to, if you click on view options, annotate, you should be able to write your name in one of these time blocks. So fill these up. If you want to come in and spend 10, with, 10 minutes with me going over your exam, uh, if these fill up and more people want to come in, then I will add to this. Okay, otherwise, if you're not going to sign up for this and you're done, you can leave, have a good day, work on your study guide, make appointments with your PLFs for one-on-ones. Yeah, when you're putting your name on here, if you click on the T, so rather than writing it with the drawing tool, click on the T and click in the box, it'll allow you to type. That'll be a little better. So is that your only office hours on Wednesday? You're not gonna be doing anything else? Uh, if this fills up and more people wanna come in, I will, I will do this outside my office hours, but I'd like to do my office hours first. Okay.
Uh, as me, you took my spot. I was trying to write it, and then you freaking texted it. <laughs> but Esme's will probably only take five minutes. Yeah, I just need you to go in. Are you guys having some trouble writing your name here? It's pretty funny. Let me go in to see what that one problem she got wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just need like five minutes. So even if it's like 12, 15, I'm fine. Like Cindy can. Yeah, if someone wants to come in. I mean, technically my office hours end at 12, 15, but I'll, I don't mind seeing someone at 12, 15. Hey, Professor, would you mind just going back real quick to the, the active recovery? I feel like I'm missing something about why continuing to exercise helps. So if someone just finished their workout and their heart is pumping, we don't want them to sit down. We want them to keep moving around. One reason is to keep the skeletal muscle pump active to increase venous return. And the other one is to help clear lactic acid. So muscle contraction in the slow twitch fibers activates lactate dehydrogenase to bring lactic acid into those muscles, clearing it out of the blood. So it helps us clear lactic acid. Increases venous return, clears lactic acid. Okay, I feel like maybe I was just thinking about it too much. Mm -hmm. All right, if you guys are signed up and you don't want to ask me any more questions, you can go. I will see you guys on Wednesday. Trying to take the 340 slot, but I can't do it at the moment. My laptop's kind of... Here, I'll let me see if I can do it for you. Thank you, Professor. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, that's about it. Louis, that's good? Yes. Gracias. Thank you. You're welcome. So the whole want me to put your name in here for you? So if you sign up, just sign into Zoom at your time, and I'll be there. Oh, I had a question. So the whole point of uh, clearing the lactic acid an active recovery? The clearing lactic acid is part of the active recovery, yes. It being active during recovery helps you clear lactic acid, which is just helps you recover faster. Which is most important if you have another performance coming up or another interval. Okay. If you're just going home, it doesn't matter. You can take as long as you want to return your pH to normal. Uh, I have two people signed up at three o'clock, Eddie and Ani. I think Eddie was there first. Ani's still on here? Yeah. Um, can I move you? To 310, honey? Yeah, that's fine. And why would the buildup of lactic acid be bad? Because uh, the hydrogen causes fatigue. So if you're going to do oh, another okay. interval, for example, if I have you doing sprints, if I have you doing sprints with one minute rest in between, it's better to walk around during that rest or jog around during that rest rather than sit. It'll clear more lactic acid if you're active and you'll be able to perform better on your next sprint. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And they both lead back to increasing venous return, right? Incre well, increasing venous return is the skeletal muscle pump. Clearing lactic acid is the muscle contraction activating the lactate dehydrogenase. Okay, thank you. Anything else, guys? I wonder if I print this, I wonder if those, what you guys typed in will appear. 
I doubt it will. Professor? Yep. Um, I moved to, to, to Thursday at 3.20. Um, Caroline's going to take my spot at 12.10. Okay. What's Caroline's last name? H. What is it? Paige. She's at 11.50 on Wednesday. So um, she's oh, going to move to okay. bed. Okay, so the 11.50 slot is open now. Why are you guys sticking around? Go have your day. You just want to hang out with me? In case there's any more questions. <laughs> you can ask more questions. Yeah, same. I'm typing these in so that they show up on my document. So for ventilatory threshold, it's the point at which ventilation rate begins to increase rapidly as intensity increases and it mirrors the lactate threshold. So um, I mean, in, in lay terms, it's just when you start getting out of breath. As you're, okay. If you're increasing your intensity, five miles per hour, you're comfortable. Six miles per hour, you're out of breath. You've hit your, lact you've hit your ventilatory threshold, which means you've also hit your lactate threshold. And can you remind me of the link between those? Because I have, the link is um, bicarbonate buffer. Mm -hmm. um, so when you hit your lactate threshold, you're producing a lot of lactic acid. So the bicarbonate buffer is working. Bicarbonate buffer is going to create carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is what causes your ventilation rate to increase. So the more active your buffer is, the faster your breathing rate will be because you're trying to blow off the carbon dioxide. Sure, um, an increase in bicarbonate buffer is gonna increase uh, carbon dioxide, which is gonna increase ventil or ven ventilatory threshold. Yeah, it's gonna increase your breathing rate, your ventil ventilation rate. All right, you guys, if you don't have more questions, I'm going to sign off. Thank you. You're very welcome.